Pastor Bob here from God's Grace Bible Church, and we're so glad that you could uh, tune in this morning. As you know, our nation, especially our state in certain areas, uh, have been overtaken by the COVID-19 coronavirus outbreak. Now, personally, uh, I don't take too much of this whole thing. But there are elderly people in our population. There are people susceptible to uh, the disease and, and the effects of it. And also, it's not just the threat of this particular virus now. It is the threat of future uh, problems that come with it. So uh, the, the guys and, and I, we came to the conclusion that it would be best for us and our individual church body that we would suspend services uh, for the next couple weeks. And we'll hold to that. I grudgingly hold to that because there's nothing I like better than to be together in church, fellowship, and one with another. That's what the idea of the body of Christ is about. However, I also don't think that we should be tempting God. If we know things could be a problem, we ought to avoid it. If it's going to be an ice storm on, in winter, uh, don't come to church. If you want to come to church, do so. You know, I usually do not cancel for snowstorms, uh, mainly because I'm out in it all the time and everything. I will show up, and you never know who's going to show up. But this particular instance, uh, I think it's a little different than anything that we've seen in history. And yes, quite possibly, you know, it could all blow over. It could be just a, a government scheme. But I'm going to lean on the side of cautious of caution and, and, and treat this as some have looked at it as a leak of a bioweapon, which could do... Uh, you know, more things in the future. So that's that's the route I'm taking or we're taking uh, in this situation. You know, uh, it's why tempt fate? Uh, and it's I don't think it's chicken to not have church services. Uh, you know, after all, are we saved by attending church or are we saved by grace through faith? And I'll go with the latter, by the way. And, and also, uh, should we go to church whenever possible? Yes, indeed. But there are circumstances in which to stay home. And uh, this is a good time. I think social uh, separation or whatever they call it, I think that's a good thing with a virus like this that's circulating around. If you don't have to come into contact with people, uh, don't do it. That's the, those are wise things. Wash your hands, all those precautions. Uh, but yet, I, I think it was wise for us to have to have uh, canceled uh, services. I hate using the word canceled uh, because you know it's just something I don't like. But however, uh, it has been done, which is the which is the subject of of our message today. The message today that we have is from first peter uh or second peter chapter number three and and first off let me go with a couple things of course we're looking at uh not being in church today as we're watching this and next sunday uh when we have brother august rosado uh scheduled to be with us we'll we'll we'll, we'll reschedule with him and then the, the following week would be uh uh, the 1st of April, and Lord willing, uh, everything will be back to normal, or quite uh, to normal, and we'll have our communion service. And just for uh, just for safety, uh, we'll, we'll just have coffee and afterwards and everything. Uh, but don't worry about having our uh, fellowship dinner that day. So I, I think that's a safe thing to do. And then on April 12th is Resurrection Sunday and uh, we'll plan on on going forth with that and uh, what better way to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ than 
uh, than having that service specifically looking at the resurrection. And uh, another thing, if Christ be not risen from the dead, our faith is indeed vain. Amen. So let, let's go to another song right now and, and then we'll be right back and, and we'll pick it up with our message this morning. that you're back and glad to be back today our message it's called be prepared and it's based on second peter chapter 3 verses 9 through 18 and that reads the lord is not slack concerning his promise as some men count slackness but is long suffering to usward not willing that any should perish but all should come to repentance but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in the which the heaven shall pass away with great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent heat the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness looking for and hasting hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent, that ye may be found of him in peace, without spot and blameless an account that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures, unto their own destruction. 
Ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things before, beware lest ye also, being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness. But grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory, both now and forever. Amen. And dear Lord, we just pray that you would bless this time that we have together. And we do pray that, that we would just look at your word as being sufficient for all of our needs, for all of our salvation, sanctification, and glorification. And, and Lord, we just pray that you would have your will and your way with us this morning. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, one thing I want to look at this morning is, I, I call this message, Be Prepared. And oh, one thing that this whole coronavirus outbreak has done, it has showed how much we as Americans are unprepared. We're unprepared to face anything that comes our way. I hope you as a believer are prepared that when trials come, that you are, are grounded in the Word of God and that you grow in that Word of God as Peter exhorts believers to do. That's our only hope. But yet, through our production systems and, and our import and export policies, we have made it so that most Americans in the supply chain along the line isn't really prepared for the future. I guess we could learn a thing from Joseph and and the Egyptians in preparing for famine, but yet we have not done that. Uh, we take for granted the fact that we can go to the grocery store no matter what time it is and go at any time and get the things we need without much thought behind it. However, that's one thing the coronavirus here has done. It showed how much we have not been prepared for. But unlike the coronavirus, unlike the coronavirus, there is something that all people should be prepared for, and that is to be prepared to meet their maker. Be prepared to meet their God, and that's there's only one way you can do that, and it's by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe in the gospel that he died on the cross according to the scriptures. He was buried according to the scriptures. He rose again according to the scriptures. That's the good news. Believing that is what gives you your place to have your sins forgiven and also to go to heaven. So, so all along, Americans and many people who call themselves Christians today are unprepared for the future. Are you prepared? Let's look at the text here. I'm just going to get to a couple a couple places in the text this morning. Uh, back to Second Peter chapter 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness. In other words, people were thinking, oh boy, when is the Lord returning? When's it going to happen? But he's not willing that any perish, but all come to repentance. The verse below, above it, above it in verse number 8 says, But beloved, be not ignorant, of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. No, to the Lord, a hundred years or a thousand years is as nothing. The Lord God is above and beyond all constraints of time. He is eternal. And that's what he promises, eternal life, to those who believe upon him. Uh, the Lord is coming. This is a promise. He's not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, Lord. The reason he doesn't come. Oh, wait a minute. Let me backtrack a little bit here. And let me, let me look at uh, the people who Peter was writing to. 
Peter was writing to the remnant Jewish believers who were all undergoing persecution in Jerusalem, and they were being scattered abroad to all over the all over the place. And so they were looking for uh, the coming kingdom to happen at any time. Uh, and so too must we as well. By the way, the rapture of the church, it doesn't require any signs or anything whatsoever. So they were looking for, through that persecution, they were, they were to expect that the Lord would be coming at any time. But there's that warning, one day with the Lord is a thousand years, and a thousand years is as as a day. So the Lord is patient. He will come. And one of the great parts, it says here, but is long-suffering to us, word. In other words, to those, he's long-suffering to those who do not believe. He's patient. He's uh, uh, not willing that any should perish. See, that's the Lord's mercy through it all. The Lord could have come just like that anytime with no warning, and he could have kicked everyone into hell, but he's long-suffering and patient, not desiring that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And you know what? What happens, I'm afraid what will happen even with the same people being afraid of running out of food and toilet paper and all different things, once this is over, they're going to do just like the Israelites did. They're going to forget about God. They're, gonna, they're, they're blaming him for, for these things happening. They're crying out to him, but as soon as they have their toilet paper back, <laughs> we don't need God. We have Scots. I'm sorry, but that's that's just the way people are. But nonetheless, God is patient and, and not desiring any to perish. Uh, let me let me let me go ahead here in the next verses, verse uh, continuing verse number nine, that his promises have always been there. Let's go to Isaiah chapter forty six. Isaiah 46, and I'm using my, just because of my vision, I'm using my, my tablet, so I'm a little slower still. Isaiah 46, and I'm not going to read the whole chapter as I, as I like to do. Isaiah 46, let's see where we're going to go to. We are going to go to uh, verse number 9. Verse number 9 through 18. Verses number 9 through, oh, I'm sorry, verse 14. Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is none else. I am God, and there is none like me. See, God, he's going back in, in, in this prophecy, dealing with the judgment of Israel. He's still pleading with the people to remember him, uh, that he is God. There is no other God. The top, of the, the top of the chapter deals with people bowing down to idols. Well, let's go back there. Let, let's go back there. Verse number one. Uh, Bel boweth down, Nebo stoopeth, their idols were upon the beasts, and upon the cattle your carriages were heavy laden. They are a burden to the weary beast. They stoop, they bow down together, they could not deliver the burden, but themselves are gone into captivity. Hearken unto me, O house of Jacob, and all the remnant of the house of Israel, which are borne by me from the belly, which are carried from the womb. And even to your old age, I am he. And even to whore hairs will I carry you. I have made and I will bear, even I will carry and will deliver you. He's talking to the, the nation of Israel here about this. To whom will you liken me and make me equal and compare me that we may be like? They lavish gold out of the bag, and weigh silver in the balance, and hire a goldsmith, and he maketh it a god. They fall down, yea, they worship. 
They bear him upon the shoulder. They carry him and set him in his place, and he standeth. From his place shall he not remove? Yea, one shall cry unto him, yet can he not answer, nor save him out of his trouble. Now that's any idol. I think of it as though they carry him on his shoulder. I think of the Marian processions that still take place uh, around around the world. They carry a statue of Mary uh, on their shoulders, and, and people throw money at this statue and all kinds of things, praying to it that, that this could bring them their peace and prosperity. Now we go to verse number 8. Remember this. And show yourselves, men, bring it again to mind, O ye transgressors, the answer to get away from idolatry, as well as getting away from sin, even if, and even in our day, is verse 9. Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is none else I am God, and there is none like me. Christian, this doesn't directly apply to you. However... However, if you have lost sight of who God is, if you don't have joy in your salvation, if you are having trouble in your faith, remember this. Remember the former things of old. What's the former things of old? Remember the day of your salvation. Remember when you called out to Jesus Christ, when you accepted his gift of salvation, the former things of old, for I am God. You know, God has never quit being God. He is still God no matter what. He is eternal no matter what. And there is none else. I am God. And there is none like me. Verse number 10, declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. See, that's dealing with the promises, the Abrahamic covenant, the Davidic covenant, the, the regathering of Israel and, and the millennial kingdom altogether. He's, he's declared that from the beginning, and it's been rejected. But yet those will come to pass. Calling calling a ravenous bird from the east, the man that executeth my counsel from a far uh, country. Yea, I have spoken it. I have spoken it. I will bring, I will also bring it to pass. I have purposed it. I will also do it. Hearken unto me, ye stout-hearted, that are far from righteousness. I bring near my righteousness. I shall not be far off, or it shall not be far off, and my salvation shall not tarry, and I will place salvation in Zion for Israel, my glory. This, I'm sure, is what Peter was thinking of when he wrote to those that were dispersed in his epistles. Let's turn now to, to Hebrews chapter, chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. Oh, but isn't that a great chapter? I think if you read read all through uh, the book of Isaiah, you'll find so many uh, so many blessings, especially prophetic blessings upon Israel mostly. That's why you need to rightly rightly divide the word of God of what pertains to us and what pertains to Israel, etc. Uh, verse, let's go, I was going to go to verse 37. Let's start off with verse, verse 35 through the end of the chapter. Hebrews 10, 35 says, Cast not away, therefore, your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward, in other words, don't lose sight of the confidence and faith in Christ. For ye have need of patience. Oh, don't we all? One thing that is dangerous to do is ask the Lord for patience, even though you need it. <laughs> for ye have need of patience, that after you have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. 
for yet a little while, and he that shall come will come, and will not tarry. Coming again, coming again. Oh, what a wonderful day it will be. Jesus is coming again. Sorry for offending you with my singing, but that's a reality. He's coming again. It'll be a little while. Have patience. One day is a thousand years and a thousand years as a day. Look at verse number 38. Now the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. What is this faith in? Is this faith in church or pastor? Faith in the economic system, the government system? Faith in yourself? That seems to be the growing trend. You need a lot of faith in yourself. God's dream you need to have for yourself. And, and God will fulfill it in this life. No, our faith is in Christ. It's a steadfast faith. It's a sure faith. It's a faith that will not go away. A love that will not let me be. That's a love that will not go away. Now look at verse number 39 before we move on back in Second Peter. But we are not of them who draw back into perdition but uh, to into perdition, you know, we're, we're not going to be damnable. We're not going to be unsaved. But of them that believe to the saving of the soul. The saving of the soul deals with sanctification. It deals with the finished work of Jesus Christ. You have it all in Christ Jesus. Have patience. He's coming. No matter what we're going through. COVID-19, surgery, uh, a broken arm, a broken leg, persecution, no matter what, patience through those things. This is what Peter's audience was going through, going through the persecution taking place in Jerusalem. And they were looking for a better place to go. They were looking for a heavenly city, the new Jerusalem. But yet they would be scattered around and, and a few years later, all of the nation of Israel will be scattered around through all of the world until 1948, where the, they would begin being regathered back to their land. Oh, the promised land is still the land of promise. And the land of promise is still the promised land. Let's go to uh, uh, Isaiah chapter 30, while we're here. He's not slack concerning his promises, and he's long-suffering. Isaiah 30. And again, as I'm scrolling through here, I'm just thinking how good the Lord is. Isaiah 30. I'd much rather a paper Bible, but uh, however, this does it because I can see it better. Isaiah 30, in verse number, I'm planning on going to verse number 18. Isaiah 30. Let's go to uh, verse 17. It says, 1,000 shall flee at the rebuke of one. At the rebuke of five shall ye flee, till ye be left as a beacon upon the top of a mountain, and an ensign on the hill. And therefore will the Lord wait, that he may be gracious unto you, and therefore will he be exalted, that he may, be, may have mercy upon you, for the Lord is a God of judgment. Blessed are all they that wait for him. For the people shall dwell in Zion at Jerusalem, they shall weep no more. He will be very gracious unto thee at the voice of thy cry, when he shall hear it. He will answer thee. Let me make sure. Uh, and though the Lord give you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction, yet shall not thy teachers removed into a corner any more, but thine eyes shall see thy teachers. 
I'm going to continue. I was going to end here in verse 20. And thine ears shall hear a word behind thee, saying, This is the way. Walk ye in it. When ye turn to the right hand and when ye turn to the left, ye shall also defile the covering of the graven images of silver and the ornament of thy molten images of gold. Thou shalt cast them away as a menstruous cloth. Thou shalt say unto it, Get thee hence. Then shall he give the rain of thy seed, that they, thou shalt sow the ground withal, and the bread of increase of the earth, and it shall be fat and plenteous. In that day shall my cattle feed in large pastures. See, if Israel had gotten rid of her idolatry and turned to the Lord, he and his long suffering still is going to have mercy on Israel. All Israel that's believing Israel will be saved at one day. However, this shows God's patience, his long suffering to them. Back to back to Second Peter. I think we're only going to get through these couple verses here. He's not slack, as some men count slackness, but he's long-suffering to usward. The usward there were those believers, those believing, uh, those believing Jews who were being persecuted. Look, he's going to have his way with us. And also for us Christians today, he is long-suffering to usward as well. Do you know that God does put up with you? You know, if salvation were counted or based upon your performance, you wouldn't have it. That's a fact. But it's not based on us. It's based on receiving the gift of salvation. That's why God is patient. He did all the work. He knows what we go through. He knows our trials. He knows our griefs and pains. He knows it all. Believer, why don't you trust him today? You've trusted him for salvation. Did you know that sanctification and glorification are part of that same package? Amen. What a glorious thing that is. It's not separate. You don't believe the gospel and then submit yourself to the Lordship of Christ and, and have to work for that salvation. It's all together. Amen. He's patient with us. So when you've blown it with certain sins, the, the idea is you can't make it up to God. Simply turn to him. Simply repent, trust him through it all. And let's continue with, with the passage. It's long suffering to us, Lord. Not willing that any should perish. That's the will of God for all people. That's the will of God for the entire human race. Let me read that again not willing that any should perish. That's why the, the Calvinist doctrine of election is so off. He, he desires all to come to repentance. Let's go to the book of Romans for a second. The book of Romans, chapter number 2. And again, this is another one. I'll, I'll try not to read the whole thing, even though I think it's important. See, we miss so much. I speak to many ministries, many churches that focus on trying to build up your life by just taking one scripture out of context. I would rather err on the side of caution caution, 
and read a whole chapter chapter to get the context of it than try to build my theology around my beliefs, my philosophies. So it's important. You know, have patience. You know, I love it. One of the one of the, the biggest criticisms I get is is uh, I read too much Bible. Not from everybody. I used to hear it too much. Oh, it's too much Bible. You know, all we hear is the Bible. You know, people want to be entertained and everything. I'm not here to entertain. I'm here because of the Bible. Verse number one of Romans chapter number two. Based on the, the, the sin being pointed out in chapter one. Therefore, thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest, for wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself, for that thou judgest, doeth the same things. This points to pointing the bony finger of judgment against somebody else. Look what you've done. You've sinned against the mighty God. And meanwhile, pointing right back to themselves is that very same judgment. Verse number two. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. Yes, God's judgment is much better than man's judgment. See, because man will judge on their own standards rather than God's standards. God's standard is is faith in his son. The love that he has for mankind is his standard. Verse number three. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? It's what you do when you put things in your own hand. Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. You know how you can change your mind about any situation or any situation that somebody else has? It's through the kindness of God leading to repentance. And what was that kindness? Well, that kindness is this. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that whosoever believeth on him will never perish but have everlasting life. That is the kindness of God in action. Let's go to Romans 5. Romans chapter 5. This one I could go to the whole chapter. Verse number 5, old believer here. Therefore, being justified by faith, how is one justified by faith? You're declared righteous. That's what justification means. You're justified by faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We don't have peace through anything we did. We have peace through what Jesus did. By whom also... We have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. See, Peter would later say that Paul writes some things which are hard to be understood. But yet these are the things that, that Paul was talking about that were foreign to the, the Jewish believers at the time that were familiar with the law. You mean I don't have to do uh, perform the works of the law to find favor with God? No. That has been taken care of through the Lord Jesus Christ and through Paul's doctrine and justification by faith. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience and experience hope and hope maketh not a shame, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. Oh boy, that you could put that right in in Second Peter about the patience and looking to the, the the coming of the Lord. 
Just, just hold on to that. And love... Oh, wait a minute, wrong verse. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. I like how Paul doesn't say that yet when in this particular place, in the end, that we were totally dead. We were without strength. We had no power to, to save ourselves. We had no power to forgive our sins. The same time Christ died for the ungodly. You know who the ungodly was? If I had a mirror, I'd put it up. The ungodly is me. The ungodly is you. The ungodly is everyone who is separated from God like Adam was separated from God. You are tainted. You are a sinner. That's not, not too popular these days. I don't care who you are. Some people say, no, oh, don't call a, a person that's a believer a sinner. Well, guess what? You're at the same time, you're a saint and sinner. You still sin, but yet you've been forgiven of those sins. And you'll be free. You've already been freed from the penalty of sin through Christ. And through sanctification, you're being freed from the power of sin. That's an everyday part of sanctification, but that's part of the package of salvation or justification. And one day, oh, one day, could be today, be with the presence of the Lord and you'll be free from the presence of sin. No longer will you have sin. Look, the reason I have glasses and diseases and gray hair and wrinkles and and all these things is because of who I am. I'm a sinner. I'm made after the image of likeness of Adam. I'm going to die physically one day. Could be today. That's the same for everyone. Those that don't have, that have an expectation that they're going to live forever on this planet and they're going to find the great cure for their, their diseases, they, they have no clue with what the doctrine of man, the doctrine of sin is all about. Let me continue here or else I, I'll... I'll go for another hour or two, which I have all the time in the world. I don't really care. For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Verse 7 is, is this kindness or long-suffering of God in action and his desire for all to come to repentance. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. See, the blood justifies. His resurrection sanctifies. And because of that, there's no wrath that will come upon him. The wrath will come upon the world. The wrath will come upon those who don't believe in Christ. For if when we were enemies... We were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. His resurrection points to our lives as well. We'll be saved. Our lives will be saved through his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. This atonement makes you separate for service unto him. We're free from sin because of him. I think I have to continue here and not get to 
uh, verse number 10. <laughs> I almost said I'm sorry, but I don't apologize for that. Amen. Um, wherefore, as by one man, sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. All. Everyone. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who was the figure of him that was to come. I always like to think of that. Uh, I think of the, uh, until the law, sin was in the world, but sin was not imputed when there is no law. That would be like driving a car through the Bonneville Salt Flats. And there's no speed limit there. You can drive 200 miles an hour through those salt flats. You know, that's where they test a lot of speed cars and stuff. 200 miles an hour. But if the law had suddenly put up a sign that said the speed limit's now 100, uh, the sin of going 200 would now be imputed to you. That's what the law did. Sin was in the world, but it wasn't it wasn't imputed to, to men or put on man's account because the law wasn't there. So between Adam and and Moses, sin sin was everywhere, but yet it wasn't until the law came that it was that it was uh, charged to one's account. So that all have sinned. You know, God took care of those things through floods and you know, the scattering of the people in Babylon, uh, from Babel, etc. You know, God had his way with that. But after that, after the law came, there's no excuse for for man any longer, or especially the nation of Israel under the Mosaic law. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ hath abounded unto many. So sin through Adam came upon all, and Jesus Christ hath abounded unto many. In other words, not everybody is saved. There is no such thing as universalism. But the, the many are those who receive, who repent, and receive the free gift of salvation through Jesus Christ. God will not force his hand upon you. Uh, let me keep on going. Not And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift, for the judgment was by one to condemnation. But the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. See, the free gift of salvation through what Christ did leads to justification, being declared righteous through the one. For if, verse number 17, For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. Therefore, all because of that, therefore, it's there for a reason, as by the offense of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. Yes, Jesus died for all. No doubt about it, not just an elect few that he died for, but he died for all. For as by, uh, for as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness 
unto eternal life by Jesus Christ, our Lord. And to that I say, praise the Lord for that. See? Sin is upon every man. We can't help it. We're just like Adam. We choose sin. It's a natural thing for us to do. That's what the natural man does. However, the remedy is not to obey the law. The remedy is faith in Jesus Christ, our Lord. You know, perhaps, perhaps you're watching this. You're, you're looking around. You, your church, like ours, isn't meeting today. And you've strayed upon this YouTube channel or Facebook Live or, or whatever, however we, <laughs> let me get the words out, however you've gotten here, perhaps you realize that you're of the many who are under the sin of one, namely Adam. Perhaps you are going through trials and tribulation. You don't know any way out of it. Well, first of all, uh, the earthly trials happen to everyone. The idea is that you can have peace through those trials through Christ Jesus. But the main thing is that what you need is to be forgiven of your sins and go to heaven. Amen. That's the, the greatest you need. That will go a lot longer than, than toilet paper or or bread or, or Lysol wipes in this day and age we're in right now. Eternal life, it's a reality. Eternal life is the benefit of you being reconciled with God, of you receiving the gift of salvation. And that's what I mean. It is a gift. Not that anyone should uh, should boast. Let me let me go there so I don't just read it, so I don't just uh, miss anything, but Ephesians chapter 2. Verse number one says, and you, he's talking to, to believers here, but this is what, what the believers were getting a reminder of what made them believers. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation, in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in, in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace are ye saved, and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness, is that kindness once again, toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And believe it or not, if it weren't a gift from God, many men would boast. Look what I did. This was a, a, a this is a picture of the Apostle Paul while he was Saul of Tarsus, and that's a, a subject for another day. He'd say, look at me. I'm the Pharisee of Pharisees, and he had to count all that as dung for the excellency of Christ Jesus. 
So it's a gift. Mm -hmm.